Steve? We're going to start on time? Okay. No, I'm good. Stay there, stay there, stay there. We're going to start now. I'll call you up. Is, is, is um, Deborah, there you are. Okay. All right, we have a big day, so we're going to start on time. It's 9 o'clock, so please uh, join our, our day. Um, my name is Ron Stout, and yesterday I started my second year as president of the College of Law Practice Management, and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the college. Hey, all right, yeah, I love that. I love that. That's, that's a bad thing. Um, that, that, at that, I'm not Stephen Mason. Steve, Stephen Mason is here. Stephen's over, oh, pardon me, over in the front there, but uh, we'll leave it up so he can find his way up here when he has to. Um, in addition, yesterday, uh, Maggie Calicrate. Maggie, are you in the room? Way in the back in the corner became president-elect of the college. And... Um, and Bill Mignoran, Bill, where are you? Bill's over here, became, um, I guess, re repeated a term as treasurer. And Dick Potter, Dick? Dick, right in the middle. So we have all three of the sections mapped out with an officer. So if you have questions, just reach out for your officer. Um, I couldn't be more delighted to welcome all of you um, to uh, Chicago Kent on behalf of the College of Law Practice Management. It's like Old Friends Week. I mean, there's not enough time to say hello to everybody, uh, and the people that I don't know, I'm just delighted to be meeting. Um, can I do one more thing? Can, can the people who are fellows of the college right now hold up your hand? Whoa, amazing. People are going to be fellows in about uh, 48 hours. Hold up your hand. Terrific. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk more about you new folks in a minute. Um, two other um, tasks before I, um, I ask the, the, the dean to welcome you on behalf of the college. One is, nothing happens at the College of Law Practice Management, literally nothing, unless Karen Rosen does it or helps organize it. And so Karen is our administrator. I don't know, Karen, are you in the room? You're still outside. Karen, there she is. Come in and say hello. Thank you so much. And, and there are no events like this where important eminent people from across the country come and join us at the law school that aren't organized and managed by Deb Villa. And Deb is in the back there. Deb, thank you very much. Um, it's, Deb, it's Deb's swan song. She, like all of us, aspire to be is retiring. So um, this will be the last time that she, she helps us with this process. The other thing I want to mention is a, a sort of an innovation. I'm, I'm an educator. Lots of you are educators in various ways, both in your profession and in law schools. Um, so what we're trying to do today is engage some of our Chicago Kent students um, in sort of a networking opportunity with you. So we've invited um, about 30 Chicago Kent students, uh, 10 or 12 for each of these rotating TED sessions to uh, join the group and be a part of the breakout sessions and mix and have, have a drink with you or have a donut or whatever. So you know, see those name tags with the red dots on them and, and ask them about themselves and introduce yourselves to them and have an opportunity to, to, um, to uh, meet them and let them meet you. That will be a service to them and I hope you'll, you'll find that valuable too. Um, my boss, Hal Krent is the uh, Dean of the Chicago Kent College of Law. Uh, thank you, President Ron. Um, Ron said that I was supposed to welcome you, and I do want to welcome you on behalf of the students that Ron mentioned, as well as the faculty and staff. It is a little quieter on a Friday than it is during a Monday through Thursday. But I actually want to thank you. I want to thank you for, instead, for deliberating upon the future of our profession. The stat that sort of overwhelms me, and I think other deans across the country, is the fact that applications in the last three years have gone down 40%, and the early returns from October are that they'll probably go down another uh, 10 to 15% again um, this, for this year. You know, that suggests a huge sea change. You know the sea change, you've been working with it, and deans are working with it as well as, as best they can. Doesn't mean that we know exactly how to guide ourselves, but I think you'll see a lot of schools trying to re-engineer courses, courses with project management as we're doing, courses with more technology, which Ron is leading, um, courses that try to help students understand the realities of law practice at an earlier age. I like to think that Chicago Kent, we anticipated the need for more practice-ready students. Um, after all, we pioneered the five-year, five-semester legal writing program years ago, and we developed not only law and computers with Ron in the 1980s, 
But we also did something that I think is really critical about 30 years ago as well, which is we started an own law firm in-house, where we have practitioners who are professors in criminal law, employment law, in immigration and tax, and transactional law, et cetera, that work with students on cases. And their salaries then, of course, vary depending upon the size of the cases and what they can bring in. And so students really get this sort of cushioned understanding of what the realities of law practice are at an earlier time. Well, we're, we're not being content to stay where we are, despite those innovations which I think are critical for our students. And we have a whole range of things that we're trying to do. And I want to just share one with you today, because the faculty has only approved one set of recommendations so far. But I'm very pleased with it, because I think what they've recognized is that in today's society and employment statistic, that students have to focus at an earlier age, on an earlier time in law school, on their professional goals. So we're giving them an opportunity in the second semester to begin that determination. So for instance, if you want to practice IP, you can take patent law now in your first year. So with that patent law background in the first year, that can help shape your subsequent curricular choices, shape your externships and your jobs, because you may then begin to think, I don't want to go into patents. Or you may say that this is right for me and then have the ability to get more in-depth education before you graduate. Or if you haven't come from a family of lawyers, you don't understand what the TV shows really mean about law, you can take a clinical rotation that we've devised with our in-house clinicians so that a student will have three different experiences working with immigration, tax, and transactional in their first year so that that can then inform their choices subsequently about what they're good at, what they want to do, and how best they can realize their ambitions. So in a sense, we are experimenting in inverting the third year experiential component on its head by putting that experiential component in the first year. I think that'll be a great help to students in winnowing their choices and helping their focus and spend their way on their career. Many schools are doing a lot of different alternative approaches, but I do think your work is critical because we all try to learn from it and try to translate that into different educational experiences, different curricula for our students so they can be as ready as possible given the fact that there are fewer traditional jobs that don't pay as well, so we need them to be creative and think about the new types of jobs that are available and have an edge in that way. So thank Ron for his leader. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank Ron for... When I say Ron in leadership, I automatically cough. Um, so um, take it away, Ron. <laughs> oh, nice, uh, thank you. Oh. Nice, nice tie, too. I like it. Um, over the next two days, all four of the core activities of the College of Law Practice Management are going to be on display. So tomorrow evening, um, 20 new accomplished professional um, achievers will be admitted formally into the College of Law Practice Management. Um, today after lunch, three extraordinary new innovations will receive InnovAction Awards. Um, tomorrow at lunch, our legal services, our legal aid initiative um, with uh, the Legal Services Corporation will be sort of on display and, and discussed at lunch with uh, our fellow and the president of the Legal Services Corporation, Jim Sandman. And in just a second, right, the fifth College of Law Practice Management Futures Conference will get launched in a brand new format in an extraordinarily interactive and, and, and we think, a powerful way. Um, and the reason for that is because of three people who just worked incessantly. I mean, almost in an irritating way they worked so hard. Because I, I, I had to go to these meetings. I think I had 100 meetings um, over the last six months. Um, and I just want them to, to stand up. So Susan Duncan's here in the first row, Deb McMurray right behind her, and Steve Nelson. They did just a spectacular job. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, and, and sort of here to tell you about what's going to happen and how it's going to go forward is Steve. Thank you, Ron, and welcome uh, to the conference. Uh, uh, when we first started to uh, plan this, uh, uh, this Futures Conference, the first thing we did was uh, we got uh, some evaluations out to all the last year's attendees and fellows. And what we got back was a near unanimous view that, we, uh, that the, uh, the fellows wanted this conference to be much more interactive 
and really call upon the knowledge and expertise of probably the number one group of you know, legal industry experts in the world, which is this body. So we planned this format, which includes some very short TED presentations from some great experts who uh, will, will, will challenge us in a number of areas, and then follow that with breakout sessions. Uh, there should be no more than 10 or 11 people per session. Um, so we can talk more and get in depth about some of the issues that were raised. Uh, I want to thank uh, both Deborah McMurray again and Susan Duncan for, for their help in putting this all together. Absolutely have to thank Karen Rosen for, uh, for her, her organizational skills and uh, you know, helping get the trains to run on time here. And then also I want to thank Ron for his support and thoughts along the way. Uh, one great thing that you're going to find um, uh, today will be that uh, the second TED session, which is on innovation, will be preceded by the InnovAction Awards. So I think that will get everybody starting to think about innovation and what that means. And then Jordan Furlong will, will follow that up with his TED Talk. Similarly, tomorrow's TED session uh, on law school Innovations will be preceded by a panel uh, co-chaired or uh, co-chaired by Ron or chaired by Ron Stout on justice, lawyers, and lit litigation or legal education in the digital age. Um, I want to uh, just remind everybody that our hashtag is uh, hashtag COLPM. Last year we were trending number one for at least five minutes. <laughs> So, uh, so no, no, we had a very good uh, account on that. So please uh, feel free to tweet out thoughts and and comments, etc. So, without further ado, let's get this party started. And um, since uh, Stephen Mason was called to the bar, I love that called to the bar. That's something I, that happens to me at ten o'clock at night. Uh, in 1977. He's had a long and varied career as a tax lawyer, as a strategic advisor to law firms and a whole another group of legal organizations, and is currently, among other things, the professor of strategy at the University of Law in the United Kingdom. He's the author of Law Firm Strategy, Competitive Advantage and Valuation, also the author of Making Sense of Law Firms, and just this year, he's uh, the co-author of a new Oxford University Press book simply called Company Law. He was inducted into the uh, College of Law Practice Management in 2000. And so without further ado, let's give uh, Stephen Mason a hearty welcome. And, and he will, and he will t t talk to us. The microphone on and then follow it with three themes my first theme is what is law for second is what are lawyers for and then when I've got some answers to those questions I think I can go on and say what is the future of law so let me start with the first theme what's the purpose of law what's it for 
And I've been given that quite a bit of thought recently. And one of the papers that you had in the pre-conference pack is a reference to a paper of mine on legal services regulation and the public interest. And that's my answer to the question, what's law for? It is to advance the public interest. But a very particular expression of the public interest, because for me there are two fundamental parts of what is the public interest. The first is the public interest in the very fabric of society. How we create, maintain and protect the fabric of society, the state itself, its security, the rule of law, its government, its economics. Without that, we have no framework for social or economic human existence. And law has to provide the underpinnings for that fabric of society. And then secondly, the public interest requires the legitimate participation of citizens in society. There's no point in having those rights if we can't exercise them. There's no point in being alive if we're not educated, we're not fed, we're not housed, we're not healthy. We have no dignity. So the legitimate participation of citizens in society requires some notion of citizenship. Who's entitled to be a citizen and who isn't and what do we do with those who aren't? The whole issue of migration from state to state, from society to society, is an important issue for law and lawyers. The other part of legitimate participation is about the relationships we have with each other and with organisations and the state itself. What underpins those relationships? What gives them structure? What gives them reliability? What gives them stability? And it's legal relationships, whether it's contract or tort or any other forms of legal underpinnings of the relationships we have, we want, we wish to pursue. And the final part of legitimate participation is justice. Because those relationships won't always be true. They won't always be stable. And we need access to justice through law and lawyers to allow people to enforce their rights, to seek compensation, to address imbalances in power or indeed the abuse of power by organisations and government. And law's purpose is to support all of that. Maybe there's a subsidiary question, not just what is law for, but who is it for? And my answer, of course, would be it's for society and it's for citizens. It is not for lawyers. So in our expression of the law, we need law that makes sense to those who wish to use it, not those who wish to practice it. If only it were that easy. We need sensible law, accessible law, as simple as possible. It needs to be relevant and acceptable. And you can understand the European whimsy when the European Union starts dishing out regulations on the degree of acceptable curvature in cucumbers and bananas. And you really have to say, is that what law is for? And I don't think it is. Which leads me to my first proposition at the end of the section, uh, what is law? What is it for? And my proposition is this. I think government, and governments actually, around the world, and lawyers are losing sight of law's purpose. And if we don't regain that sight of its proper purpose, then the future of law will be very different and might not be what we want. So that's what's law for. What are lawyers for? At a trite level, you could say lawyers are there to achieve law's purpose. So it is to advise and represent those who seek legal advice, who wish to pursue their legal rights or enforce the obligations that others have assumed. So it is about creating, supporting, sometimes challenging legal rights and obligations. I think we all know that. But the angle I want to take is that being able to do that is a privilege. It's a privilege that comes with responsibilities. When we ask what lawyers are for, if they are to pursue that noble calling, of course they need to be competent. 
But just being competent in technical law, we've known for years, is not enough. Sure, being incompetent in technical law is not going to get lawyers and society very far, but just being technically competent doesn't get us far enough. How do you apply that law to help people in their personal and business relationships? How do you run a law practice to make sure that what you're doing is effective, efficient and valuable, as well as consistent with the law? And how do you do all of that ethically, as opposed to unethically? So when we talk about lawyer competence, we need a very broad conception. And part of the challenge here, when we say what are lawyers for, is that although we might wish that law was simple and so simple that clients could always work it out for themselves, it isn't. It never has been, probably never will be. So that privilege is to fill the gap between what the law is and what lawyers know and what clients need. And that is an asymmetry. Now, the economists call that market failure because there's an asymmetry between a supplier and a buyer. I think that's unfortunate terminology. It's an asymmetry that's inevitable in any form of specialisation. Why, why do we try and found regulation on the basis that that is a failure when it's actually inevitable? I would say it's a positive. It's a good job that there are people around who've got that specialisation who can help clients pursue their rights, solve their problems, solve their disputes. So there is an asymmetry. And it's that asymmetry that gives rise to the need for protection. So when we're asking what are lawyers for, it is to help society and citizens. But we also need to help society and citizens by making sure that the lawyers who have the privilege don't abuse the asymmetry in that relationship. And that's where regulation often has to come in and supposedly fill the gap. My problem is that I think I know what lawyers are for. But let's look at the real world and then say, what is it that lawyers actually do? And is what they do what they must do? And is what they do and what they must do the same as what they should do? And I can't get those to line up. You look at what lawyers do, it's pretty well everything on the legal waterfront, whether they must do it or should do it or not. <coughs> so what we've had is the ability of lawyers to carve out territory that probably goes beyond what they must and should do. They are overactive. When it comes to what they must do, then that's a question for regulation. It's as much a political and social question as it is a legal one. And there are differences of approach. So if you look at the US and the notion of the unauthorised practice of law, that's putting a pretty wide boundary around what lawyers must do because nobody else must do it. Whereas in the UK, and I come back to this, we have a much smaller area of what's known as reserved territory, the things that only lawyers are allowed to do. Much smaller. So in the UK, on the face of it, we've got a much bigger gap than you do between what lawyers actually do and what lawyers must do. But even in your territory, I would venture to suggest that what lawyers actually do is way beyond what they must do. So we've still got a gap. And I want to return to the question of what they should do towards the end. So what we have is a society where lawyers do more than they need to, more than they must. And they tend, therefore, to create work to justify the sheer number of people who are qualified as lawyers. They make work to do. They make law more complex. They do things that perhaps they don't need to do. They perhaps pursue spurious claims, all of which keeps them busy in law's territory but may not be consistent with what lawyers must do or should do. So what we have is an artificial market for legal services, where lawyers are doing more than they need to, 
probably using the wrong people to do it, using a suspect business model to pursue it, and unfairly and unreasonably and unnecessarily protected by regulation in helping them to do it. So, when I answer the second question, what are lawyers for, here's another proposition. That lawyers and their regulators have lost sight of what lawyers are for. And again, if we can't answer that question sensibly, the future of law could be very different. So I'm positing a society where government and lawyers are losing sight of what law's for and where lawyers and regulators are losing sight of what lawyers are for. So let's look at the future. What is law's purpose? And I'm going to start from a proposition, and I'm happy to be challenged on it, that there is declining demand across the world from clients for legal services that are too complex, over-lawyered, overpriced, and overprotected. So where do we go from there? And I think we need to start again. We need to try and reconnect with law's purpose, with that notion of the public interest. We, try, we need to try to reconnect with value to the people who are paying us. A, a new or a better concept of what acting in the client's best interests means. And we need to reconnect with a set of values that are about how we should practice well and act in the professional interest. So what we need is a recalibration of the public interest, the client interest and the professional interest. Not the separation of them, but a recalibration and a rejoining of them. And what I'm talking about there is, I think, professional integrity in a business context. It's about profitable ethics and ethical profits. And they're not mutually exclusive. So what's stopping us? It's not the why we do it, which would be about achieving law's purpose. I think it's about the how we do it. And what I'm about to explain isn't new for those of you who might have been following things I've said about this market in recent years. My proposition about how we do it and why law's future is in a dangerous place at the moment and why it needs to be very different is that the traditional model of legal practice is fatally flawed. There are four bits to it that I think have just gone wrong. The wheels are off. The first is that we've lost track of how to create value for clients. And a model that is based on charging for time, which is measuring the cost of input, not the value of output, is fundamentally flawed if you're trying to create value for those who pay. And I know there, are, there have been conversations for years about alternative billing, and isn't that an interesting expression? Alternative to what? Alternative to the normal, alternative to the right which is time-based billing. Well, it's not an alternative to that. It's a new way of saying, how do we price legal services? It's a very different question. We should be pricing for value, not cost, not time. So we need to rethink how we create value for clients. And I'm not talking about taking them out for a drink or a meal or to a theatre or to a ball game. I'm not talking about inviting them to participate in a webinar or sending them some brochure. I'm not talking about secondments. What I think we really need to do is look at the essence of the advice and representation we are giving at the time to this client on this issue and say, how do we create value in doing that? It's not about adding value, it's about creating value. 
And that might mean doing things differently. It might mean being inventive and innovative in the solution we come up with or the way we do it. It might mean combining with other types of people, other professionals, other businesses, that create an offering to the client that is valuable because it takes a problem away from them. That it gives them a bigger and better solution rather than just a legal one. So we absolutely have to rethink value. Second bit of the business model that's broken is how we resource law firms and legal services. Because too much of that resourcing emphasis is on lawyers. It's the lawyers doing everything when they don't need to. And one of the insidious consequences of having lawyers do everything is that everything is framed in terms of lawyers. And the rest are non-lawyers. <laughs> How do you think 99.5% of the population feels being described as a non-something? Isn't it not surprising that we have tensions inside law firms when there are lawyers and non-lawyers? As if the non-lawyers don't do anything valuable or productive. We'll try getting rid of all of them, then see how productive the lawyers are. So we need to rethink resourcing, and it goes way beyond having just lawyers there, somehow supported by other people. Why don't we support them with technology, with processes, with other types of relationships, internal, external, with systems and processes in and of the organisation, like its strategy, its structure, its culture, its approach to knowledge management, the way it builds its brand and reputation, all of the things that make an organisation what it is, separate and distinct from the individuals who populate it. That would give you a very different notion of what's valuable in a law firm. And, of course, you'd have to connect it to how you were trying to create value for your clients. Because the resource base you need is the one that creates the value that the clients are willing to pay for. And those two things alone would give us a remarkably different feel and structure to legal services. The third bit of the business model is how we finance own and structure these organisations. And historically, of course, regulation has required that the only people who can finance, structure and own a law firm are the lawyers, the partner owners of the business, perhaps with a bit of bank borrowing. <coughs> but no access to capital like any other business. And the reason for that restriction is that these non-lawyers cannot be trusted to deliver quality or ethics. Now remember, that's 99.5% of the population we are not trusting to behave ethically because we as lawyers are the only ones who can be trusted to deliver quality and ethical legal services. So you might understand why I'm fascinated, not just with the ABA's resistance, but with the resistance of many professional bodies around the world who sit on that high moral horse and say nobody else should be allowed near the ownership and investment opportunity that law firms present. I think it's dangerous territory. Remember when we used to teach on an MBA in the UK on law firm management? We talked about ethical decision-making. We had three tests that we invited people to apply. The mother test, the front page test, and the smell test. And the mother test was having made your decision on what you think is an ethical basis, how do you think your mother would react? <laughs> now, actually the likes of the ABA are pretty good territory on that one because their mothers are proud of them and will support anything they decide. The front page test is imagine you make your decision and it ends up on the front page of a newspaper all these days, showered all over social media. How do you feel about that decision being broadcast? Well, again, 
the resistors probably don't have an awful lot to worry about because 99.5% of the population look at that headline and think, yeah, and? That's exactly what we would have expected. So at least resistors are behaving to type. It's the smell test where I think we get some real traction on this resistance. Because it's a spectrum, isn't it? From that faint whiff of somebody behaving arrogantly or in a patronising way to a potential nasty stench of self-interested protectionism, which is really dangerous territory for a profession to be on. So do we really believe that only lawyers can own and manage? Well, we've had an experiment in the UK, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. But let me just deal with the fourth bit of the broken business model, and that's the rewards. What we have in legal practice, typically, is a reward system that pays out too much, too quickly, to the wrong people, for doing the wrong thing. <laughs> Apart from that, it's perfect. <laughs> what we're not looking at is what is it we're trying to reward? Who has created this value? Because profit is a return on that risk and value creation. Who has actually created it? And when? And for what sort of contribution? And are they all lawyers? Certainly not. Did other people make a valuable contribution? Yes, they did. Is it right that they should be rewarded? Absolutely. But why should we only reward as income? What partners have created in the business with the help of other people? Why do we take all of that money out as income? Usually, rates of tax on capital are much lower than income, so that's not a terribly clever decision. <coughs> Usually businesses need investment and all the profits taken out, there is no investment fund. That's not terribly clever. We're actually taking out as income what is in fact a capital return. And we're taking it out now rather than later. So the whole model is skewed towards immediate short-term income returns for a select few, not all of whom have created the value. And if we were in a real market rather than an artificial market, that would not happen. So for me, the business model for the future has to look at the rewards. Who should we be rewarding? For which contributions? Do we reward them now or later? And do we reward them with income or capital? What is the correct combination of all of those variables? rather than this rather blunt instrument that we've had historically. So that's the way in which the business model will evolve, because this is about economic evolution as well as regulatory evolution. And the history of a lot of lawyer regulation is that it follows behind market moves that have already happened. These things will probably happen, whether the regulators want it to or not, because there's a sense there's a logic, there's a reason behind doing things differently. And that's largely what drove the English move towards alternative business structures. These vehicles that now allow people other than lawyers to own and invest in a law firm. In fact, in England, a law firm could theoretically be wholly owned by people who aren't lawyers which is a huge shift from the position five years ago when a law firm could only be wholly owned by solicitors. You can understand why the legal profession is somewhat frightened uh, over there. The structure for ABS is, is not what many people think it is. It is not a license for charlatans and crooks and the unethical to get into legal services, rape and pillage and run off with the profit. It is a vehicle that allows people who aren't lawyers to become regulated as if they were a law firm. They have to provide the same sorts of regulated activities 
as qualified lawyers do. They have to do it in the same way. They are subject to the same ethical obligations as lawyers, and they have to have the same compensation and insurance arrangements as lawyers. The idea that this has created a free-for-all is profoundly wrong. So we have, in the first two years, a number of alternative businesses that are now licensed to provide legal services, and not all of their owners are lawyers. In the first year, there were just under 40 licenses issued for these new structures. We're just coming to the end of the second year, and there have been about 200 issued in that second year. So you can see a trend. Now, part of it is the regulators speeding up in the decision-making process, but part of it is an increasing level of interest that these forms of business unit, business vehicle, provide something that law firms and competitors to law firms would like. And that's an important point because a good number of those ABS licenses have actually been issued to existing law firms and some very small law firms. Because, you see, if you're a small law firm, historically, your practice manager or accountant is a non-lawyer and couldn't be an owner in the business. Well, now they can under an alternative business structure. Under the old system, your spouse was a non-lawyer, usually, who couldn't be a co-owner. Unlike any other form of small business unit where husbands and wives, <laughs> brothers and sisters, parents and children often got together. In law, that couldn't happen unless they were all qualified lawyers. Well, now it can. And a lot of the smaller firms have taken advantage of that liberalisation. But then you go up to the bigger end of the market. Retailers, insurance companies, very interested in parts of the legal market in England. They have entered the market through an ABS. Slater and Gordon, the world's first floated law firm in Australia, made an acquisition of a firm in England and became a licensed alternative business structure in England as well as being authorised in Australia. So at that end you start to see the same sorts of movements in business acquisition as you would see in other parts of normal business activity. And therefore, yes, the public markets through flotation or the private markets through private equity and the like are interested in investing in law firms. And has the legal world collapsed because these demons were allowed in? No. Have the regulators been swamped with a flood of complaints from clients who say they're getting poor quality, unethical, really cheap, worthless services? No, they haven't. Does that mean there will never be a criminal or unethical alternative business structure? I'd like to think so, but I very much doubt it. But hey, can you point to a legal profession around the world that hasn't had a criminal or unethical lawyer in it? What do we do when we find them? We throw them out. What do we do with non-lawyers? We stop them coming in. That's not fair. That's not a level playing field. That's not good regulation. So let me finish with this issue of regulation. It's not a question of regulation or no regulation. What we're talking about, or should be talking about, is a spectrum or degrees of regulation. What is appropriate for the risks faced in a normal marketplace. And we've got two fundamentally different approaches. And I've just hinted at them, really. We can have, before the event, assurance, which usually requires some form of accreditation, some form of licensing, which creates costs and barriers to entry. Or, and, we can have, after the event, insurance, in a sense. Redress, compensation, putting things right, or getting rid of the practitioners who don't perform properly. They're very different forms of regulation. One is about stopping things going wrong. The other 
is about putting things right afterwards. The former is very much more expensive for the regulated community and therefore for clients than the latter, typically. So if you look at, say, the US approach to unauthorised practice of law, that is effectively putting all of the regulatory emphasis on the more expensive before the event exclusion. So you only get in if you've got the appropriate qualification. I'm probably in the camp that would regulate all legal services delivered for reward. And I would therefore allow the second, after the event, redress, complaints, compensation or disciplinary sanctions to be applied to the whole of legal services, whoever they were delivered by. For me, the really interesting question for the future is who should be regulated at the point of entry? What should lawyers be regulated to do? And I have two answers to that. One is they should be regulated if there is a public interest in their regulation. And one of the things lawyers do is create the public good of the justice system, the effective and efficient administration of justice. That, to me, says that should be regulated because the court structure, the infrastructure of society, can't perform if we don't have a decent justice system and support for the rule of law. So things that affect courts, like appearing in courts or pursuing any form of litigation, for me, should be regulated and it should be done by people who are assured as competent. So that's a public good justification. The other justification I'd use is where the after the event redress is inadequate or inappropriate. So if there is a risk that I might lose my life, my liberty, my children, my home, my health, my access to education, then I'd be quite happy for those types of legal rights only to be created and pursued by those who are authorised to do so. And that, for me, would create a legitimate, before the event, barrier to entry. The people who advise on those issues are dealing with things that are so important to the client, where if things go wrong, it's too late to put it right. If I've been executed, if my children have gone, if I've been deported, if I've suffered some major health event because I couldn't access health services, all of those things are too late if we only rely on after the event assurance. So we've got those two approaches. Both are underpinned by a system of professional ethics and standards. And that's important too. They're just as good a form of regulation as formal regulation. The way lawyers behave because of their ethical commitments, because of the culture that a lot of law firms create, is very important. So we've got before the event, we've got after the event, and we've got through the event as forms of regulation. And we've then got the market. Because markets are a form of co-regulation too. And I hope we're well past the argument from lawyers that we're a profession, not a business. We're not in a market, we're in a profession. Because that's really tired. If you're selling something to people, you're in business. So unless you're pro bono lawyers, you're in business. But it's right that we can't only rely on the market to regulate legal services. So it has to be in there, but it's not the whole answer. And what we end up with is a mix of formal regulation, of values through professional standards and ethics, and the market. And you know, if lawyers are as good as they say they are, if they're as necessary as they say they are, if they're as ethical as they say they are, clients and the market will recognise it and value it and buy it. There is nothing to fear in a future that is really looking for high quality ethical legal services. But I would say, let the market, let the client decide, rather than tell them that you cannot use some people because they're not appropriately licensed. 
And it's not always necessary. So I leave you with this third proposition, which is the future of law is fundamentally dependent on a new and proportionate balance between the public interest, the client interest, and the professional interest. Between law's purpose, providing value to clients, and doing so ethically. That would be a great future. And if, like me, you strongly believe in the need for a strong, independent, effective and ethical provision of legal services, then perhaps this great college can be part of the message of saying to the world, that's what we need, this is how we need to change, because if we don't, we could threaten the very fabric of society and the participation of our citizens in it. It's a noble mission. I'm sure we can rise to it. Thank you very much.